Hello everyone. Sorry, I am still working out this new system. I hope you're doing well. It is Christy. It is Sunday. It is time for Social Science Sunday. Hello, y'all. Um, hope you're doing well and you're having a good week. So by the looks of it, all of this is going along just fine. Maybe I'm a bit on the soft side. I'll turn it up a little bit. So I'm kissing the, I'm kissing the, um, the yellows on uh, the chart. Wow, wording is hard today. I've not yet spoken. <laughs> I didn't even like do songs to wrap up or warm up, but hey everyone, thank you for stopping by. I can't quite see you at the moment because I have a full screen of other things. So I'm going to try to bring y'all up. I don't think I can necessarily put you in the same window because of how things are like. So this is basically like what we're going to be talking about today. So yeah, we're going to have a little chat about Jordan Peterson's <sighs> takes, shall we say? Oh, you don't care about that. Uh, takes on science, I guess is what you could call it. However, I mean, that's a pretty loose description of what he was doing. So, <laughs> but I do want to say hello to people. So let me just work out how to get into the chat to say hi to you all. And I can't do that. Um, so hold on one second. Ah, exit. Uh, there we go. Live stream. There you are. There y'all are. Let's pop you out. Let's. No, I don't want to remove the message. <laughs> I want to pop you out. There you go. So I want to say hi to some people before we start. All right, so in the chat today, A to Decay, good to see you. Angus987, thank you for stopping by. DN Fan 292 always uh, appreciate when you guys stop, when y'all stop by. Raru23 and Sibwolf, how you doing? Egg Shelly Berry. Oh, Mama Sid. Oh, lots of familiar faces. Trans Gamer Girl. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone, for stopping by on your Sunday. And if you're not stopping by live, thank you for stopping by in the future. I appreciate that, too. All right. And now I think we can do the, um, the PowerPoint thing, although I might have already screwed it up. I'm going to take this, move it over to a window where I can grab you and have a reference to what you're all saying, because I can't put you on the screen and have... What do you call that? A, uh, a stream, um, a, a, a full slideshow at the same time. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is this nonsense from Jordan Peterson, um, who really should know better and apparently doesn't. So I guess we should start kind of at the beginning. Oh, where's my coffee? I'm definitely going to need my coffee for this. Um, okay, I guess I can do also do the full slideshow now. View, slideshow. That'll work. Look how fancy. Look how fancy I'm getting. Fancy! Which, I only know that song because of Uncle Roger making references to K-pop. That's the only way I know the fancy song. 
Anyway, we are going to talk about the fact that Jordan Peterson hasn't really demonstrated a competence in understanding what social science is. Now, I will say that, you know, he has published with other psychologists and their papers have used quantitative methods. I've glanced over them briefly. I haven't read them in full because it's not my field. But I do know that he's worked with people who understand what science is. But then again, you can always collaborate with somebody who brings a part of your skill set that's missing. And I feel like that's what happened. I feel like Jordan Peterson got invited down to some papers. And they're like, we just need you for the theory part, Jordan. We don't actually need you for the maths part at all. Because we know you're, you're really not into that. And yeah, I'm just going to basically like mock him, I guess, is pretty much the only thing I can say here because um, what he's saying is ridiculous. So what in, okay, so, so in the last week, just for the record, Jordan Peterson went on the Joe Rogan show and made um, a butt of himself, a butt of a joke, we can say. He made ridiculous statements. The first coming out of his mouth was climate is everything, which is like, if you want to pretend you're a scientist, Jordan, then you would know that, like, we don't try to model everything. We don't need a, a model of everything because when it comes to any particular outcome, there are going to be a few things that are causal factors. And you don't actually need to account for everything because not everything will have an impact on the thing you're interested in. So, you know, yes, are lottery tickets part of the climate? The yes, I guess, because it happens inside of it. But if somebody wins the lottery or not, doesn't really have an impact on the climate. Carbon dioxide emissions do, you know? And so we're going to look at just his science fail here with some references to his modeling, actual modeling in the social sciences, why the natural science and the social sciences use the same methods, but treating them as equivalent makes no sense. Um, how e economy, uh, the economy and the stock market is not comparable to, you know, like um, climatologists analyzing data from, you know, uh, uh, 10,000 years ago, 150,000 years ago. All right, so let's, let's just start with the, the fail. And this is a reply to his tweet that he did himself. And then under this is his crappy book, which I don't recommend anyone read if this is a preview of the kind of garbage that's inside of it. All right. So what Jordan writes is, the climate models can predict the past. <coughs> Screech? What? What? Um, I don't know that you know how words work, Jordan. I mean, like, this is, this is your writing. You get to choose whatever words you want. This is, this is great, right? You, like, you have total freedom to use whatever words you want in order to make your point. And here's the thing. Um, oh, no, no, I have a thing about but prediction. I have a thing in here. Yeah, all right. When we talk about prediction in the generic sense, right, then we're talking about some sort of estimate or guess, because they can be two different, they're two different things of what the likelihood of a certain outcome will be in the future, right? We're trying to say, okay, we think that this is going to happen or this won't happen. That's a layperson sort of use of prediction. Um, now, the, the scientific use of the word prediction is quite different. We're talking about a statement of the expected results of an experiment or in a theory based on a hypothesis. And I guess a good way to talk, think about, this is very helpful, to think about scientific hypotheses as if then. If it's the case that gravity works according to how Newton describes it, then we would predict that this particular outcome would happen. If it is the case that rational choice theory best accounts for people's voting decisions, then we should see um, measures of, that capture the, rational, the causal mechanisms in rational choice having the largest effect sizes in our model that tries to estimate the like, you know, why people are voting. And so we have a very clear tie to a specific causal mechanism that we use it 
that we assume that that causal mechanism is true and then we make a very precise or relatively precise up down significant or not prediction as to what the results would look like if our theory were correct if then right so <laughs> um so climate models don't predict the past they estimate the past the past has already happened it's not an unknown it might be difficult to be precise about but it's not an event that has yet to occur and so models climate models don't estimate or sorry don't predict the past climatologists use observable data guided by natural laws how things we know work in physics in order to estimate um, what you know the temperature ranges were right and he, precise, he pre means the word predict to explain. Yeah, and, and that's wrong. <laughs> if you guys have been watching our show, we know that there's a bit of debate in the social sciences whether or not prediction is explanation. If you can predict event, have you explained it? Well, kind of. I mean, clearly you're on to something, right? But, you know, have you explained everything about it? No, I don't think so. I think prediction is um, a way for you to evaluate what theories are very helpful or which ones are only helpful on the margins. But anyway, all right. Um, just like models of the stock market. Now, I'm confused by this second sentence, right? Because he says here, just like the models of the stock market can predict the past. I mean, well, like, think about the logic here. The climate models can predict the past just like models of the stock market. I think he's talking about the future here, and he's not using very precise language. All right, um, I defy these modelers. And I, I, like, why are you putting modelers in quotations? Because, you know, if you're saying that, um, that things can be modeled, you're not objecting to the notion of modeling uh, of, of creating a model that allows you to test a theory to predict an outcome. He really wants to sow doubt in the results of the findings of climatologists, but honestly, he completely misses the point on what these models are meant to really show us. So, I defy these modelers to predict one stock accurately for one year and to bet their own money on the outcome. This has, I mean, other than a demeasuring contest? I mean, this really has no intellectual value whatsoever because one, climate models are, are already functioning with a known fact. And the known fact is the thing that Jordan doesn't want to talk about. And that is carbon emissions are linked to an increase in the temperature of the entire planet, to a changing climate. So it kind of doesn't matter whether or not we model 50 years out and it's off by one degree Celsius or three degrees Celsius because the causal mechanism hasn't changed. The causal mechanism is we're putting too much carbon in the atmosphere. We've already been doing that for centuries and we see the relationship between carbon output and increased temperatures. Now, it might be the case that on a cloudy day, we get a little bit more on a sunny day, or a cloudy day, we get a little bit less temperature increase, and on a sunny day, we get a bit more, but that doesn't change the fundamental physics. Carbon in atmosphere equals warmer planet. And so, like, none of this, like, uh, the prediction error bars doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because, end of the day, the only thing that matters is that we understand the causal mechanism, and we do. We know that human activity is contributing an enormous amount to the warming of the planet. And, and whining about error bars a hundred years out doesn't change that. It is a good way to distract people who don't want to deal with the future and the fact that, sorry, like on a Sunday, we're all going to die because of this stuff. We're ruining the planet. I personally am pretty pessimistic on that, but I don't want to ruin your Sunday. Uh, so this is like just it shows to me the complete nonsense. Of, of what goes on in the man's head and how he cons people. He really isn't a smart... No, he might be smart in terms of his capacity for learning, but he's not as knowledgeable as he thinks he is. He's really not as humble on his understanding of topics when he tries to white-mansplain things. Right. So 
One stock is a lot less complex than climate, particularly out a century. That might be the stupidest thing. I mean, there's a lot of stupid things, like ridiculous, all right, if people feel worried about ableist language. That might be the most ridiculous part. That last sentence, one stock is a lot less complex than climate, particularly out of century. And in case it's not intuitively obvious to you, let me explain. All right, so what he is saying that is that modeling the climate, which is based on known relationships that we can measure out, like carbon output to increases in temperature. And um, the way that heat interacts, and we know that there's, it gets, it gets complicated, but all of the things that we're working with operate within natural law, right? Like a, a thing of water isn't just gonna appear in my lap spontaneously, right? We have object permanence, like the universe doesn't work randomly. There are laws that we, like there are things that we observe in nature that are consistent. And that means it will be consistent in the future. Now, stocks are not only not based on physical laws that we can predict, right? They're based on a whole lot of things. Um, it could be the country of the stock that you picked. It could be the industry. It could be the fact that that particular company does better than its competitors. It could be that uh, people get wrong information um, and or good information that affects the stock. It could be the fact that, you know, like uh, the economy changes, unemployment changes, suppliers change. There's the entire social world that you have to factor in to predict a stock price on top of things like natural disasters and weather patterns and other, um, let's say, you know, like physical barriers. So there's actually two different things that you need to be able to account for, the social world and the material world, the physical world. When trying to predict a stock, if you want to, you know, model all the particular outcomes, it's ridiculous. It's just, it's not even comparing apples and oranges. It is so much more difficult to model um, and to predict human behavior than it is to predict what an atom will do. Because atoms can't make choices. You know, atoms will, they aren't acting irrationally or on emotion or whatever else, right? They're not motivated by greed or holding off because they've got a lot of self-restraint. That's not how water works. They just do what they do. So this idea that um, somehow predicting a stock is a lot less complicated than predicting natural laws, I mean, it's just, I, it's so, I can't, I can't take this man seriously. Not that I was before, but I don't know why anyone takes this man seriously. All right. So he's talking about modeling, and I'm really going to nail him on this. Hold on one quick second. I think what I'm going to do is... Yeah, there I am. How about I do this? Boo -doo, boo -doo, boo -boo. Hey, look at me in the corner. That's me in the corner. <laughs> All right. Now, I've gone on and on about rational choice theory as a model because it's got like four... Uh, well, five different like letters in it. So it, as a model, it's pretty easy to understand. Even if, if you go to read rational choice theory, they love their maths and game theory. They love their mathematics. You're going to see all kinds of equations and formulas. But this one is pretty straightforward. Now, they, they change the U from in utility to the R, which is fine. It's just the same concept represented by a different letter. But all right, so this is what a typical, this is a very basic version of what a social science model would look like. And what I'll say here is rational choice theory of voting has a long history dating at least to Downs 1957, who recognized that where voting is costly, individuals will consider both how much they care about the outcome and the likelihood that their vote will influence the outcome, be pivotal. Now, again, you can disagree with the theory, that's fine, but the point of a theory is to have a causal mechanism. And here, people are considering how much they care about it and the likelihood that their vote will influence the outcome. That is a very good and narrow definition of rational choice theory. I tend to, I see sometimes ones with this utility measure in there that kind of like captures everything not covered by rational choice theory. And I personally, I'm, I'm not a fan of that. I like a very narrow theory rather than an all-encompassing get to Freud and Adler kind of theory. All right. Uh, without developing it. Okay. 
Down suggested a solution based on the idea that there are important private and social benefits to the act of voting that might accrue to individuals and give them an incentive to vote. We call this the expressive benefit. Riker and Orshuk extended Dow's idea in a useful model of the decision to vote that starts with a rational assumption that individuals will vote if their expected utility from voting is higher than their expected utility from not voting. In other words, is it going to bug you more to sit on your couch and have the election pass you by and not have your say than, uh, you know, to go get up and go do your, you know, vote absentee or whatever else, right? That's just, it's a get off the couch. Like how, you know, what's going to move you off the couch, so to speak. And they specify this in the following equation. R, where R is the utility gain from the per, getting the preferred outcome from seeing your candidate or party win, is a function of or equals or equals the um, the result of P the probability that your individual vote will be the tipping point to the preferable income, uh, and that's the probability of the benefit. Oh, here, okay, R, okay, R, where do they have R in the model? Hey, hey, they don't have, okay, they didn't define their R, which is what screwed me up. Okay, but their R is the utility. B is the utility from the preferred income. P is the probability of the individual vote deciding that or giving that income. C is the non-negative cost of voting. And that's kind of where I like to stop my rational choice theory estimates because I think that that's the purest form of rational choice theory and it highlights everything else. And then D is the positive benefit of the act of voting. And all of that is like the expressive benefits. You don't have to get into my nerdy social science like pre preference. But notice that it says here, R equals P times B or B times P minus C plus D. That's a very typical social science formula for, I mean, when I did my... Um, when I did my PhD, mine was like um, whatever my result was, was a function of a constant plus the effect of scoring high on masculinity or masculine measures, uh, well, agency, communion, emotional vulnerability, plus uh, ma male, female, because that was all I had access to, plus like party identification to control for, right? So there's all of these different components of the theories that are outlined in the model. And each one is meant to isolate a particular amount of variance in the output. And the more variance it accounts for, the stronger it is and as an explainer. Um, even if you have something like party identification in there and it isn't statistically significant, you still want it in there as a control variable so that you don't misattribute some of the variation explained to other things, right? And this is very common. It's just very simple, straightforward. Okay, so here's, for instance, uh, a model, right? This is, uh, I can't remember, so from government article, I'll just read this out. Building on recent works in neuroscience and cognitive psychology, cognitive science, my, my apologies, we argue that voter choice, oh, it's from the same thing, voter choice can be modeled as a competition between policy and identity. Right, so they're, they're taking a different, they're not just going on like voting or not voting. They're looking at um, this comparison of whether or not your rational choice, um, you're driven more about policy conditions or considerations or identity ones. Right? Significant evidence now supports the idea that domain general neural systems, blah, 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 blah. All right. So our model contends that if a policy exerts a major influence, then identity makes only minimal contributions and vice versa. In effect, policy and identity compete to determine their relative influence upon a subsequent integrative process. An increased weight on one identity variable, i.e. gender, would not only increase its effects, but also the effects of all other identity variables, e.g. age or patriotic Americans, while diminishing the um, effects of all policy variables. So you see here, this equation is a little bit more sophisticated than what I tend to use because I don't work within rational choice theory. However, you can see here that this is what a scientific model and the social sciences can look like. And here you've got your utility function in here, and you've got a whole bunch of stuff about weighted stuff, identity, and and policy measurements, and then you put all of that over a sum of something else in order to get a value. They have the point here is that they have very specific concepts. Those concepts can be operationalized, and that means made into something that we can observe in the world. Then we can observe them and measure them and use that data to then test our theories.
right? I want, and I'm doing this for a reason, right? I'm, I'm showing you all this nerdy stuff to show you what social science is actually like. Because I'm going to show you now a Jordan Peterson model, and I want you, without any, you know, like expertise here required, to compare the difference between this this model right here, the R equals B P. I don't know if y'all can see that, I know, but um, to and this one over here to a to a Jordan Peterson model. Okie doke. Yes, <laughs> someone has asked uh, someone in the chat. His exam question would be uh, like, why are men order and women chaos? Precisely, precisely. Right, so this, <laughs> someone making fun of Jordan Peterson, and rightly so. Jordan Peterson, you can't model the climate. Any model of the climate is only going to be an error-ridden guess. Also, Jordan Peterson, here's my model of how the human consciousness, of, uh, sorry, how the human consciousness works. I think they've forgotten a world word. Okay, so this is, um, the past already happened, but the future is different deep man that's that's like super super deep super deep stuff going on here um yeah so the future future is different models might be educated uh, might be educated hypotheses models might be educated hypotheses this makes no sense a, a, again a model describes a causal relationship using a series of interconnected statements that link together logical assertions like logical statements it's it's not might be educated hypo there's no such thing as an educated hypothesis a hypothesis is derived by theory and models i mean you can have a model competition right we have this um quite often in the social sciences because human behavior can't be summarized by like a theory of gravity human beings are just too complicated some people are influenced by socialization some people are um, influenced by, like, in the politi in political science, when it comes to voting, how cognitively engaged they are with politics. Uh, sometimes it matters on how strong their sense of party identification is. You know, you've got people in the UK who are still standing by Boris Johnson. You can't explain that based on, like, their policy preferences. That's an emotional attachment to a party. Uh, so, uh, might be educated hypotheses, but they're still hypotheses, not facts. No one said they were. No one is saying that hypotheses are facts. The straw manning, he really can't have a serious argument without straw manning an opponent that remains unnamed because it exists only in his imagination. Um, not the science, and certainly not the data, and they accumulate error across long time spans. Yes, but again, no one doubts the obviously well-demonstrated and scientifically accepted relationship between putting carbon into the atmosphere, carbon monoxide, dioxide, whatever it is. I'm not that kind of scientist, right? Um, specifically all the gases. Greenhouse gases, shall we call them, uh, leads to temperature increases in the overall climate. Like, that's just not ever doubted. And therefore, if we reduce our carbon emissions, we will eventually, not quickly, maybe not in time anymore, probably not in time anymore, see a reduction in temperature. All right, but, uh, so th this is him, right? Criticizing models and hypotheses and all this sort of stuff. You want to see, do you want to see the amazing precision, the conceptual clarity, the justified links to an empirical world, and not to mention that, the overwhelming amount of data that he's able to draw upon in order to apply to his own works? All right, here we go. Let's look at a model handwritten by Jordan Peterson. Ah, go! <laughs> this, this! He put this in his book. I have to minimize myself a little bit here. Yeah, this is his idea of a model, right? Like, look, compare. Come on, go back. Compare this. Very precise formula, very clear, def clearly defined measures, metrics, a known falsifiable hypothesis with a null hypothesis. But when Jordan Peterson sciences, this is his model. All right, so let's actually look through this garbage um, because this is nothing. This is literally 
nonsense. This is not scientific. It's barely even like conceptually disambiguated enough for you to understand the concepts. By the way, if you can hear my stomach, I really super apologize. I didn't realize, of course, it's when I get on air that my tummy, my tummy starts to rumble. So apologies in advance. However, he's got here the patriarchal world of light. So in other words, um, oh, 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 oh. And he juxtapositions that against the matriarchal world of darkness. So we've already got value judgments here in your model, Jordan. This looks like something biblical conspiracy theorists would draw up. Dean Fan, yes, absolutely. So, okay, so here I guess it's really difficult. So let's just like think about what this, let's, let's spend some time on this absolute nonsense. All right. He seems to have some sort of nested model wherein you have like a higher order thing and then a lower order things. We have this hierarchical models in the social scientists, social sciences. He could have tried to use something like that, but he didn't. So you've got this patriarchal world of light. Now, another thing about this garbage model is I can't tell the difference between the boundaries of the patriarchal world of light and the other parts of like, like for instance, we've got this as a square and we've got over here as a square, which is the matriarchal world of darkness. But these don't are these like inner do they have a line between them? Is there something that differentiate or or is this basically like uh, I, I don't understand where do these separate? Then, weirdly, he's got these sort of like orbital, elliptical dots, but these aren't named. Like I don't understand like. Ah. I keep wanting to interact. What is the difference between the straight line here and the curved line here? Like, if, if it's the patriarchal world of darkness is over here and it bumps up against the matriarchal world of, oh, sorry, the patriarchal world of oppression and the matriarchal world of being oppressed, and where do these touch? Do they inter... I can't tell. Absolutely cannot tell. Then we've got Paradise the Walled Garden. Okay, so over here in this like location, we've got a walled garden, but then pointing to it is creation of unconscious paradisal world. And that is, so why is the creation of an unconscious paradisal world like pointing at the, the walled garden of paradise? Like what is the causal mechanism here? You've got Yahweh, the spirit of God and the void matter and the deep. None of these terms, of course, being meaningfully de you know, defined here. God sends sexual to the void. And the void sends union to Yahweh. And somehow when you get when you when you when you do a sex and a union, somehow that makes a creative baby. Okay, and this is interesting, just hanging out here. By the way, this little sphere is never defined. I don't know what this, like, why, what is the, why are these two things grouped? What is the, what is the Venn diagram circle here that these two are covering? Um, the pre-cosmogonic -cosmogonic egg, but that just seems to be floating out in the middle of nowhere. There's no, there's no, there's no causal relationship. Unlike Yahweh being sexual to the void here, and then matter in the deep wanting union with God. Right? I don't understand. Is is this an inner... Is this like... Um, are these inversely related? Like the more sexual, the, the, the less union? Or is it positively correlated? The more God is sexual to the deep and matter? Then is that more union? Like I, there's no... There's no understanding. I don't understand. Right? Then you've got just like a picture of a, a, a female figure with a child. I don't know why. There are only, and a picture of a dragon. But these, this one isn't labeled. I don't think. It, because this one's labeled chaos. And oh, this one's got its own circle. Why is the person with the child in a circle? Their own circle. Like, what are these circles? What, what is the difference between a straight, a, a dark line, a dashed line, and a, and a, and a, a dotted line here? This is like garbage. I'm sorry, like, no, I'm not even sorry. This is, like, completely incoherent garbage. And this was in his book, right? 
Maybe the rectangles are just defined. We have to, if we have to guess at the contents of your table, then you failed. Basically, is is what if if someone has to look at your graph and ask themselves what is going on here, then you failed the purpose of having a graph. The point of a graph is to make abstract relationships more obvious in a concrete way. A figure is meant to use pictures and other information in order to clarify things. So you have to have some consistency. Like the, you have some kind of description of what these things are. Uh, it's garbage, right? <laughs> Probably HK. <laughs> you can, I'll show that this one because, um, yeah, you can show that when you guys aren't on screen, so you don't have to worry about that. So Jordan Peterson is really in no place, has no position at all to lecture people on on the precision or lack of precision of science. I think of this as a, a me just like referencing some of my stuff. So, oh, I wanted to justify a little bit about why it's far more difficult to predict things associated with human behavior than the natural world. And yeah, I think the last one is, uh, all right, um, get back to this. We're gonna have a look at, call it, shout not PZ Meyer here in the chat. Da -da 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 -da. Um, where is, Sure, explore it. No, I don't. Bleh. Is that the one? I just want to get to the link to PZ's article. How hard is that? Can't be that hard. Yeah, okay. PZ did a great job. By the way, uh, I will put this in the chat if you want to go read it on your own at some point in the future. There you go. All right, so he wrote this. <sighs> will this finally kill Jordan Peterson's career? No, it will not. That's quite a list of critics, the Joe uh, Rogan Peterson uh, of their self-gratification. All these people with relevant advanced degrees in climatology are explaining that Peterson is childishly inaccurate and foolish, as if maybe at some point people will wake up and realize he is a lying incompetent. Thank you, PZ. Dr. Sarah Perkins, Sir, uh, Kirk Perkins Kirkpatrick. He seems to think we fought model the future climate the same way we do weather. He sounds intelligent, but he's completely wrong. He has no freaking idea. Dr. Gavin Schmidt. Guys, for the love of everything holy, please, please have someone who knows what the heck a climate model is. Have on someone who knows what the climate model is. Peterson has managed to absorb the first part of George Box's famous dictum that all models are all models are wrong, but appears not to have worked out the second part, but some are useful, Schmidt said. Professor Steve Sherwood. Peterson was, quote, making the ancient climate climate skeptic error of mixing up weather and climate. Anyone who has taken an introductory course in climate or atmospheric science would spot this problem. Errors in weather forecast indeed accumulate such that after a couple weeks, the forecast is useless. But with climate, Sherwood said, the models work differently to project how the climate will respond to different factors such as higher levels of CO2. Peterson's argument is like saying we can't predict whether a pot of water on a flame will boil because we decide in advance that variables, what variables to put in our model and can't predict each bubble. Uh, yeah, he just got dragged all over the internet and good because he sh like that garbage should be. So here's what how PZ wraps it up. You know, people have been blasting this message since he first squelched it his way into the public consciousness with his wrong interpretations of anti-discrimination law, his wrong explanations of gender, his wrong ideas about evolution and neuroscience, his wrong notions of epidemiology and disease, all undergirded by his wrong opinions about religion and supernatural phenomenon, and his foundation is in the wrong ideas about psychology, his profession, built on bizarre Jungian, a bizarre Jungian framework. His audience doesn't seem to care. They just seem to think that he's blissfully confident about his wrongness, and that's what they love about him. So, uh, yes, the predictive powers of Pinocchio. I think, you know, we did, we were talking about rational choice theory, and it kind of ties a little bit into today's lecture, but I don't only want to do theoretical stuff on Social Science Sunday. Sometimes you just need to jump into current events on things like identity politics and Jordan Peterson in order to show the links between what we're doing and what social scientists do in, you know, in their offices on their computers and 
uh, you know, thinking these things in the real world. So we have a link here between social science theory, social science practice, and social science outcome. That's it. And that's all, that's all I really prepared for y'all today. So what I could do, I guess, is, um, trying to find, no, to camera, no, 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 er, no, um, trying to find a way to show you, I guess I could just show you the screen without, yeah, I'll just do it this way. Be a little bit on the boring side, but that's okay. All right, I'm going to move this over. Y'all can have a look at my, my German homework. Uh, I have to do conjunctive zwei, mit modal verben. That'd be fun. Can I get it to, can I get you bigger? So before we wrap up, yeah, I'm just going to read out some, say some final hellos and highs and, and head out. And thank y'all for your time. So, Yahweh in the void, that's hot, says Andrew. WTF is the dragon for egg, Shelley Barry asked. That's, an, that's a very good question. I, I can't answer it, but it is an, it's a very on-point question. Andrew, I see a mother but not a father. Yes, because women are darkness and chaos and, and evil. Let's see. I believe he was talking about the common duality of tropes found in storytelling over the history of mankind. Well, I mean, it would be helpful if, like, anything in the chart... I'm not saying that that's not the case. I'm just saying that it would be helpful if anything in the chart would, would mention that. The predictive power of Yahweh, very science, precisely. So they're really concepts or tropes that are commonly used in stories that have stood the test of time. Um, I'm, okay, so I'm going to just basically say uh, no on that. <laughs> because, oh, that's not what I want to look at. All right, let's have a look at what he's got going on here. I, 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 I just... So here's here's the problem with that explanation, right? It specifies Yahweh. <laughs> it it spec it's not he's not in this in this diagram he he can't be talking about universal tropes. He simply can't because he's using decidedly Christian terminology here, right? Um, so when we look at this particular image, uh, can I do like? I saw a button for a slideshow. Uh, there we go. Is that the one? Don't start at the top. Okay, good. Yeah, this can't be sort of universalistic tropes because he's talking very specifically here about Yahweh, the Spirit of God. And um, I, 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 I'm not entirely sure, again, what this is here. But the walled garden of paradise, again, this is Christian themes. And Christianity didn't emerge until, like, into the general Roman world, until we would say, like, the 4th century would it be sort of widely accepted. So this doesn't cover tropes and stories, like, this doesn't explain Gilgamesh or any of the pre-Christian works. So, I mean, people might have given you that line of BS that this thing here is about tropes and stories. It's just not, unless it's a specific subset of, like, post-Christian, Western, written by white men. And, and that's not all of, all of writing, uh, or, you know, or, or certainly not universal. You can't universalize that out uh, based on white men. So I, I just can't, uh, it's not, it's, I just, you know, I, I'm not going at you, Spiegelberry Farm. I'm explaining why I don't find that apologetics that used by Peterson fans to be valid because it's literally disproven by the language he uses in his own chart. So, um, right. Got a random question. Would, what would be a good merch to put a band logo on that's not a hat but wearable and more feminine? All right. Hey, Easy Seven, um, or Easy Seven. Thank you for stopping by. Sorry you missed the start. Do go back to the beginning. Don't worry. Uh, Campbell had actual ideas. Peterson has a bunch of sentences to confirm his biases. And I think Poe Mama, that, that it, you, know, you hit it, you, you got it on the nose. What we, that trope is there about like Peterson's fear of the feminine, his obvious like um, issues of resentment and anger, and his adherence to very toxic notions of masculinity and also associating, like, God with masculinity in order to justify unjustifiable. Well, no, patriarchy is justified on violence. I can hit you harder, therefore I win. And that's, like, what Peterson likes about it. Okay. Yeah, I think a scarf could, could go well. I mean, honestly, it's, it's not, it's, it's sort of, 
I mean, I don't know how common scarves are these days, but yeah, I mean, a, a football scarf, you know, like, a, like have ones that hang down. We have those for carnival, something like that. I don't, I don't really know. I'm not in a marketing mode of mind. So, all right. Hey, hey, egg Shelly Berry liked that idea. Cool. It's also not clear what constitutes paradise. Yes. And what the difference between paradise and chaos is. Nothing is clarified by the diagram. Andrew. Yeah. All y'all are so right. And <laughs> this is like the, the, the real key to, I think, doing good social science is the ability to take things that are complicated ideas and break them down into their easiest, most understandable components and then construct those in a way that you explain a complicated phenomenon in very simple terms. It's a difficult thing to do when you understand something on a very high level to break it down like that, but it also demonstrates that you know your topic inside and out. If you can explain it multiple different ways and with very clear and common and simplistic like simple language, direct language, right? So, alrighty, righty That's it for this Sunday. I hope you guys had fun. I hope you enjoyed the little discussions. Sorry, here. Duncan on Peterson. I, I know I did because I felt very frustrated. Hey, Bomber Fox, by the way, that, you know, he gets so much attention and he's so wrong. And there are so many people out there doing so much better social science. Bruce! Hey, good to see you, Bruce. Also brilliant that you are able to um, stop by. You know, you it always makes my day when you show up in my chat. Can you hear my stomach? I hope you can. I hope I've got my filter on. That's embarrassing. I really need to get some food in me. <laughs> All right. So thank you, everyone. Have a great Sunday. Have a great rest of your week. I appreciate you stopping by. I appreciate your time and attention. And yeah, next time, unless something else silly comes up, we're going to pick up with uh, more specific examples of rational choice. We talked a bit about the phenomenology behind it last time. And next time we're going to look more at the application. So yes, goodbye to everyone who showed showed up. Um, I'm, I'm dragging this out because I'm so grateful for all you coming by. But um, until next time, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Stay happy. Stay healthy. Stay well wherever and whenever it is that you are. You get to see me say goodbye now. All right, time to say goodbye. Bye.